so now we're in the uh, the question and answer phase. Um, if I can ask all our our presenters to turn on your cameras, um, and um, um, maybe I'll start out with um, with um, with Dr. Beckham. You know, you, you talked about really a, a kind of a really comprehensive uh, health department with you know interdigitations um, in in multiple areas. You know, given that really, I think one of the key roles for government is safety. And of course, health and public health are, are key aspects of safety. But at the same time, governments are struggling with, you know, competing competition for resources, building roads and bridges and, you know, and, you know, whatever. Um, and, and so there's always competition for resources. And when we're not in a pandemic situation or a crisis situation, you know, the, the winter storms in Texas or, or hurricanes or, or, you know, whatever, um, you know, public health sort of is, it's behind the scenes, you know, it, until there's a crisis. So, you know, given that local government, state and local government really are the laboratories of innovation and, and for, for best practices, how, how does that, you know, as a, as a public health agency, how does that, those concepts get sort of pushed upward so that the leadership understands really the enduring value? Because ultimately it's a leadership issue, right? I mean, resources, capacity, of course, you know, but leadership has to drive that. And so maybe it's more of a rhetorical question, but I'm curious as to your thoughts on that to, to kind of emphasize the enduring uh, role of, of public health and, and by extension, One Health. So that, that is a very good question. Thank you, Kent, for asking. Um, with anything that we do, you have to get buy-in. And how do you get buy-in? Sometimes you pitch a, a really good proposal to a listening ear. You're reaching out to your social network. So you, you know the neighbor that lives next to the governor, or you know the, the, uh, the county judge's uh, sister's dog walker. I mean, so whoever you are, whoever's going to listen, that's when that the, adv the advocacy comes in. So, um, and of course, yes, you do have to have the buy-in of the leadership, but you have to believe it as well. And so what Harris County Public Health has done, um, we had a leader that was very innovative, innovative and forward thinking, and he would go to different places and learn, um, share ideas and learn, take them back to the health department. And we brainstorm, say, hey, can we do this? What's the benefits of it? So we really digested and came up with an approach to uh, really demonstrate to our governing body, to those that will listen, the importance of One Health. We also looked around um, at the resources that we had to see what is it that we can do, whether it's minimal or not, but we had to do a good job just public health practitioners, we sell ourselves short because we have to do a good job of explaining what we do and how we do it, why we do it, and what are our resources and what's the capacity that's needed to those that make the policies, to those that um, issue out the funding, because not everyone um, qualifies or meets criteria for grant funding. So we have to speak up on that. And we have to develop those relationships. And that's and it just didn't happen overnight. So this is an ongoing thing with forums like, like this one, with One Health conferences, or any opportunity to promote One Health and its benefits. So that that's I mean that's my response on it. And it, it can get political because of the different level of politics at the local and the state and the federal levels. But we we shouldn't be discouraged and we shouldn't have despair. We should continue the momentum that we have now. So, so Terry, let me let me start with you. Um, uh, clearly, you've 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 outlined um, a number of, you know, sort of best practices, some innovations um, uh, in responding to, uh, to COVID. Uh, as we've heard um, from a number of the speakers, you know, one of one of the challenges and opportunities is to disseminate uh, some of these best practices and innovations. Um, recognizing that, you know, everywhere, Africa, 
you know, Asia, you know, US, North America, South America, et cetera. You know, there are many differences in, in jurisdictions, governments, uh, et cetera. But, you know, can you speak to any, any dissemination of best practices from, from what, what has gone on in Rwanda to the, to the regional context in other countries? Um, you know, has that been successful? Have, have, has there been adoption, you know, of some of the practices, even accounting for, you know, uh, government, cultural, language differences uh, in, in the neighboring countries? Thank you. <clears throat> Thank, that, that's really a great question. I think in terms of dissemination, uh, yeah, it's really relevant to see how uh, these best practices can be disseminated. And uh, for example, as uh, I demonstrated, one of the best practices is to, is to use uh, academic institutions and uh, channel these through uh, publications, you know, scientific evidence-based publications, whereby you know people can can access this information, the scientific community. So that, that's one way I, I see this. And uh, of course, it's still too early for the other innovations that uh, you know, have been developed, especially in terms of the ICT related uh, innovations. But uh, moving forward, the plan I think is, is to come up with ways really to uh, share this through scientific uh, forums and, and, and share best practices through you know, research institutions and uh, and I think that's 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 the plan we have so far. Okay, thank you. Um, for for Dr. Superporn, um, first of all, you know, uh, really a, a nice presentation. You've obviously been able to to accomplish a great deal. Um, I, I wonder if you could speak to, you know, the the pandemic or well, of course, we didn't realize it was a pandemic back then, but uh, mm -hmm. it is now. But but you were able to respond, you know, in a in a fairly rapid uh, and comprehensive manner. I wonder mm -hmm. if you could I wonder if you could speak to how you were able to, you know, for these initiatives that are government or academic or or government academic partnerships, you know, with with external funding entities, how are you able to move quickly, um, you know, and and to respond? Mm -hmm. For 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 the funding. Um... Actually, uh, we we have the private sector to support um, because uh, we are the tightest class. We, we during uh, the first few months uh, of uh, last year, we got a lot of uh, donation from the private sector, donate for the reagents, for the uh, the machines to make a kind of like a increase our uh, capability to test more. For example. Uh, in the past, we just can test. We can test just only uh, two or three hundred uh, cases a day. But uh, from the donation, we can expand uh, from uh, our capacity. And we also got the international uh, support from US Detra to donate the sequencer for us. So, so this this kind of like, uh, that that why we can uh, make the the flow of the, the fund and also. The government uh, pay back the the the, the cost of the, the legend back to the academic. We we not just uh, run for free, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, because we recognize that nothing's free. Yes. <laughs> and, <laughs> and 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 ultimately there has to be a bill pair. Um, yeah, yeah. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Um, uh, for Dr. Beckham, um, you know, sort of keying on the topic of of funding and bill payers. You know, recognizing that um, you know Harris County has a huge, a huge, uh, a lot of work to do. I mean, it, this is a big operation, a, a big population. You know, um, do you do do all your efforts um, rely on on appropriated government funding, or are you able to you or the leadership able to catalyze other sources of funding that augment uh, the appropriated sources, whether through foundations or nonprofits or, or, or other entities that, that have aligned interests, uh, recognizing that, you know, different groups have different areas of emphasis, but nonetheless, it can be put together. Um, ha has that been uh, a strategy that's been employed? Um, so, yes, that's a good question. And with, in, 
in order to do initiatives, you do need fun funding. So at Harris County Public Health, the majority of our efforts are uh, funded by general funds or grants. Um, but we have partnered with nonprofits, with faith-based um, organizations. Uh, there, uh, Houston has a large uh, Latinx community, so we partnered with a lot of uh, Latinx organizations to help us do outreach in specific areas where, um, you know, where there are deserts, whether it's grocery deserts, testing deserts, as I said early in the presentation. So, so it's a little bit of uh, everything, but the majority is from uh, governmental funding. Okay, all right, thank you. So, so Thierry, I'll come back to you um, uh, because uh, Dr. Beckham made a point that I think is, is relevant for the question I'm gonna ask. So, you know, can you speak to, um, you know, um, the role, either positive or negative, um, of, of traditional health practices or other cultural attitudes uh, that might be relevant uh, in Rwanda uh, during the COVID-19 response? I mean, we understand that, that, you know, one size doesn't fit all. And, and as Dr. Beckham said, you know, partnering with different groups that have particular um, societal norms, perspectives, and approaches uh, is often very helpful, but that can also be a challenge. Um, I, I wonder, Thierry, if, if you can speak to that a little bit uh, from your experience in Rwanda. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, I, I think, uh, yeah, that's a good, it's an excellent question. And uh, of course, with COVID-19, there's a lot of uh, misperceptions and uh, trying to find the different mechanisms and channels to really address some of these. So I would say like for, you know, traditional practices. Uh, so traditional medicine is currently uh, recognized by, by the ministry. So you know, we have uh, an association of uh, traditional healers that are registered with the Ministry of Health. Uh, they have frequent and regular encounters with, uh, with the Ministry of Health, you know, with folks from the Ministry of Health. So these also have been used as one of the conduit you know, to address some of these issues, of course would expect that, uh, you know, for most people, you know, with the misbeliefs and they would really straight well to the traditional healers for, you know, to seek for remedy and all that. So, yeah, given the fact that it, it, it has our, our work very easy in terms of messaging, you know, uh, you know, giving out messages that Okay. Uh, relevant. Hello? I can hear you. So, so yes, yeah, so I was saying that, uh, you know, with uh, them being part of the healthcare system, it has been very easy for us to, 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 to relay these messages, you know, through them. Um, so for people who have been using traditional, you know, who believe in traditional uh, medical practices, it has been easier for us to, to address some of those issues. And, and of course, for that to be effective, there has to be a, an element of trust between the traditional uh, provider. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Okay. Good. Um, maybe for Dr. Superporn. So, um, you know, in, in the data that you presented, um, I wonder if you could give us your opinion on, on where COVID came from and, uh, you know, uh, it, because, because the, the point is we're dealing with the pandemic now, um, but it's clear, you know, the risk hasn't gone away for other, other viruses, you know, that, that can jump from different animals. And, and so I wonder just from, you know, the extensive assessments that you've done thus far, your thoughts on, on how this all came together. Uh, you're on mute. Thank you for the question. Uh, that question should ask Peter, not me. <laughs> uh, actually, um, from, from my study in, in Thailand, but it's just uh, uh, half a year um, in last year that, that we found a uh, related uh, virus to SARS-CoV-2 in um, 
in bat and in pangolin. And I think these two animals should be one of them to be the the progeny of of the the virus that have some um, evolution that uh, transmit to human and from human to human later. So we we need more uh, surveillance to understand uh, uh, to clearly understand all the uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 related virus in animals so that we can answer the clear answer later. Yep. Okay, thank you. So let me let me throw a question out to all three um, and see see who see who has some thoughts. You know, we we've we've talked about today. You know, a, a variety of of examples of the application of sort of multidisciplinary public health, one health, uh, different aspects, um, and and you know, a lot of these things have come together because of either external funding, situations that have developed where the leadership has responded, um, you know, or, or just sort of interests and, and, and the right people, I say people, the right organizations at the table at the right time to, to develop these, these responses. But when we take a step back and think about One Health, you know, how do we, how do we develop this concept in, in our students? Um, you know, people that go to medical school, they learn how to be doctors. You know, people that, that uh, go to uh, veterinary school, they learn how to be veterinarians. Although I will say that uh, veterinarians typically have a much more one health view of the world than, than physicians. Um, but how, how, do we try to, how do we try to inculcate these concepts in our education system? You know, um, I... I, I just remember, so when I was in, in high school, you know, that's when recycling became very popular and, and in all the, all the, you know, curriculum. And now, you know, it's, it's almost, it's almost second nature to recycle things, almost. Um, you know, that, that's obviously a very pedestrian example. Uh, this is much more important, but how do, how do we try to, you know, get these concepts out there in our educational systems? And I'll, whoever wants to Whoever wants to, to, to take a stab at it. Um, so Ken, I'll take a stab at it. <clears throat> what, I've, what I've learned um, just throughout my life is that education is a key. And um, you have mentioned vet schools, medical schools, but we need to look at the primary schools um, and look at examples of other organizations that work. For instance, no smoking of how children go to their grandfathers and say, you, you know, it's going to kill you. I want you to be around. Really getting to that little core or um, actually with PETA, they really had a very animal rights organization and animal, uh, yeah, animal rights organizations have a really good marketing program. They market the elementary, the primary kids with fact sheets or with things that's going to uh, we're going to latch on to, and then the children take them home to their parents, and that goes on. We need to learn from other organizations and implement what works. And starting at the primary level, at the very small level, you mentioned recycling and how it has taken on. It took a long time, and we have a long way to go. But that's those initiatives that are at the local level, no smoking, recycling, not littering, we need to really educate our future leaders. So when they get in a position, whether it's with policies, whether it's issuing out the money or a position of authority, it's embedded in them already. So we need to start at the very beginning. Well, I think that's a, that's a great answer. And it, it goes to the point, you know, that I mentioned before is that our, that our local jurisdictions, whatever you characterized as local really are the laboratories of innovation in, in so many different ways. Uh, and and if, if, if there are ways to sort of expand on that, I, I think that's, that's a, a, critical, a critical aspect. Dr. Supaporn or Thierry, any, any other comments on, on education on One Health? Yeah, thanks. Well, I think I'll respond to this uh, based on my experience. I think we need to start 
by the educators themselves. I mean, the, the change of mindset. So uh, from my experience, I've had, you know, I led the one head steering committee in, in Rwanda some time back and you know, we had all these prominent scholars coming in and you know, being part of the One Health platform. But I mean, themselves, they couldn't agree with each other on, you know. So, I mean, how does that translate into academia without, you know, the educators themselves really not having an agreement? I think that's, that's from my experience, you know, that's, I think, also something that we need to look into. Uh, but of course, you know, the low hanging fruit, of course, is like here in, in Rwanda because, uh, well, there's education, but I mean, the low hanging fruit is in service training. You know? I mean, for us, that's how, because we have a lot of, uh, you know, brain drain. We have, uh, you know, people working in, in different sectors, you know, that, you know, the training they had. In school we had so it, it's 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 really challenging but uh, i would say first of all change of mindset and then to look for low hanging fruit okay thank you dr superman yes to add? yes yeah um i would like to give some example from from thailand that we have the one health uh coordinating unit that uh is a collaborating work uh among seven ministries and the Thailand cross together and the concept of one hill uh had uh has brought to the community level to the village health volunteer so like right now it's, it's not just uh at the um student level but uh it's the uh, community level because we we needed the the, the one health concept for um Preparedness on the any emerging infectious disease. That 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 why uh Thailand we focus uh on at the community level. We have the uh more than ten thousand of the village health volunteers uh in in our country. So this is one mechanism that we can bring the uh one health concept to the community. Okay, thank you. Maybe another question for Dr. Beckham. So you know. You, you made a comment at the outset, which, which I think is, is, a, is a true one, that, that Texas is sort of an entity unto itself mm -hmm. uh, or, you know, the equivalent. Um, but, but the point is, as we've heard, you know, um, in, in the various presentations, you know, there's a lot of disparities uh, worldwide in, in public health and places that are well-funded, well-supported, good infrastructure, presumably do better than, than those that are not. Texas has many, many rural counties, you know, um, and 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 places where the infrastructure is not very good. There are limitations in education. Uh, the, the economy is not the best, et cetera. You know, how how. You know, how, how do the best practices, you know, that that Harris County has developed and continues to refine and apply? How do those best practices, how, how do they get adopted in places that really don't have much, you know, and, you know, it's even if they want to, you know, I mean, how, how do you do public health light, you know, and, and one health light? Any thoughts? Yeah, that's a, another good question. Um, so my take on it is that <clears throat> there needs to be a scan done with the uh, public health entities, they may not be, not all public health, uh, local health uh, departments look the same. So it's like app, like fruit, you have apples, oranges, bananas, but it's sort of hard to compare, but they do provide essential RA or several essential public health services. So doing an internal scan of what you have and actually understanding what one health concept is um, and what is it that you can do. So if there is a rule, um, if there is a local health organization that's in a rural area and these two services that they have are immunization for kids and um, inspecting restaurants. Well, you, you may have two people that make up that restaurant. They can only do what they can do. And, and that would be empower them with knowledge. So when there is the right timing to advocate for One Health or to actually implement something, 
is to, uh, while they're out and about the sanitarian that's inspecting, they can look and see, tires are looking to see where mosquitoes are breeding and, uh, you know, partner with someone or, or find some type of funding to uh, dump mosquito dumps in there to inhibit the breeding of mosquitoes. I mean, these are real basic things that we can do. And some organizations may be doing one health and not even realize it. Another thing that I think will go a long way with um, Harris, Co Harris County Public Health, we, we have the concept, we have the initiative, we, we actually finally have um, positions that can carry forth the initiatives and the work that's uh, to be done with One Health. But we have a role too, is to share the knowledge and the experience and the lessons with others. And we could do that by mentoring uh, or using the train the trainer concept and it could be done virtually. So somebody in, in North Dakota or someone um, around the globe, we can have these mentoring sessions and share the best practices like we did with, um, with, with COVID-19 last year with South Korea consulate and with uh, areas in China. Yeah, I mean, there's there's so much good knowledge out there that uh, you know the challenge is really just getting it disseminated in the in the right context, and maybe maybe to follow on to that for Dr. Superporn, what do you think about the idea of of something more broad? We we heard you know Dr. Gooseby early earlier talk about you know greater empowerment of of the WHO um, in these sorts of things, but what about some sort of intergovernmental one health panel? I mean, we're, you know, we're, cause that's, that's the focus of this particular workshop is one health. Although we recognize that it is intrinsically public health, but, but what about some, some intergovernmental one health panel where both these best practices as well as scientific considerations can be sort of weaved into policy that can then be customized for regional and national uh, considerations. Okay, thank you for the question. Um, for, for in Thailand, the, the One Health practice uh, in the government it, uh, in three min ministry is quite strong. Uh, I mean, at the Ministry of Public Health, Department of District Control, uh, and Department of Livestock, and Department of Wildlife, they are re working really closely. But um, just, uh, and one thing that connect them together is the research work. For example, the, the predict work that I, I work uh, for 10 years that we, uh, test the, the novel analysis. So we have a mechanism that we have to report to all uh, government sectors. So this is one kind of the mechanism that uh, pull them together to, to, to uh, work, to uh, learn what we are uh, working. I think uh, the, the research work from academic is the, the good tool to bring the government sector together, you know, because uh, actually the government uh, officer, they have a lot of routine work. They not have enough time to uh, work more on the research or the, the one health concept. So, but for, for this, we, we can bring them to work together. Yep. Okay, thank you. Um, I think we've kind of hit all the big questions that have come up. So um, I think at this point, I, I wanna thank all the, all the presenters. Uh, you know, three very interesting presentations, highly relevant uh, to our current, current situation, um, both in terms of COVID uh, as well as public health, One Health. So I wanna thank all three of you, uh, very, very nice presentations. Um, and so, so with that, maybe maybe what I'll do is 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 um, have a few observations uh, on today's session, uh, and then we can look forward to tomorrow's event. So, I think at the outset, um, uh, you know, I think Dr. Goosby really um, laid it out: three key, three three key aspects: detection, response, and prevention. And you know, whether you you put that under the One Health rubric or just public health in general, which we understand really they fit together because they're, they're sort of one and the same. Um, I, I think that really 
lays it out as, as really the imperatives uh, for all of us uh, and for decision makers, um, you know, who, whose job is to really keep, keep the population safe. Um, with, with respect to our uh, presentations in this section, I'm trying to define the the current one state health uh, one health state of affairs and and our examples. A number of themes came up, um, and and I think these were cross cutting across all the speakers in different ways. Uh, and these are in no particular order, but I think are are all very relevant. The first is coordination. Um, we recognize that that there is no one discipline that quote unquote owns one health, so it is multidisciplinary. And for this to be effective, the coordination has to be there. Sometimes it's organic, it just happens, but usually it requires something more than just organicity. Um, and, and we heard, uh, you know, whether from an urban large, you know, population uh, uh, county in Texas, Harris County, uh, uh, a national response, focusing on surveillance and detection in Thailand, as well as a, a broad public health response uh, uh, in, in Rwanda to the, to the COVID pandemic. All of this requires coordination. And, and I think everyone who's attending today, who's worked in this arena knows coordination is not easy. Just when you think you have it right, it breaks uh, and requires constant sustainment. Um, so I think that's, that's a major theme that has emerged. The second, which is a natural uh, follow-up, is, is the, the multidisciplinary uh, status or, or role of, of One Health. It really is the key. Um, everything from vectors, vector control, um, uh, zoonoses, um, environmental impacts, public health, uh, healthcare systems, uh, education, and more. Um, and and we, again, we, we heard in all the talks today uh, the value and the importance of the multidisciplinary uh, aspects related to One Health. And importantly, you know, this is not, uh, One Health is not owned by, by professionals uh, in, in the various areas. This is really a partnership between professionals, paraprofessionals, and the community. And, and going to the issue of education uh, from the earliest, the earliest stages really is a way to inculcate the One Health concepts, maybe not the science, probably not the science <laughs> in, in primary school, but, but the idea and the value of, of the multidisciplinary aspects of One Health. Third theme is capacity. We can have a lot of great ideas, but if we don't have the ability to, to execute, uh, to surveil, to respond, to prevent, um, that's a problem. And, and, and so, uh, that's obviously we're not going to solve that today, um, but but clearly you know ideas have to have the capacity to execute those ideas, and so that's really important. A fourth theme is innovation. Um, we heard of a number of of by necessity innovations that have developed in response to uh, whether it's in response to COVID, um, whether it's in response to uh, different types of, of, of um, ways to get to uh, uh, individual populations or societal groupings. Um, and, and so innovation is incredibly important. Um, you know, it's not just, and it's not just all science in the laboratory, that, that's part of it, clearly. But it's, it's, it's the approach to populations, it's the approach to policy. Just because it hasn't been done before doesn't mean it shouldn't be tried. And we heard a number of of examples of, of innovative practices that are suitable, hopefully, for greater dissemination, um, whether regionally or beyond. I think the last theme, which is probably the most important, which all of our speakers touched on, and certainly Dr. Goosby did uh, in his keynote, is leadership. Um, because you can have a well-functioning public health organization um, that's operating in the background. And if the leadership has no idea as to its role, there's no way that that public health organization can be well positioned to respond for crisis situations or to, or to anticipate crisis situations in the future. And so just like in so many aspects of, of public policy, having enlightened leadership 
educated leadership. Um, I, I, I like I liked uh, Dr. Beckham's comment. You know, if we get them early, when they when they grow up and become leaders, you know, maybe they'll get it. I, I'm paraphrasing, um, but but I think the point is well taken. Um, it requires leadership um, because these problems come and go, and and of course, you know, um, the attention tends to turn away after the problem is is gone. Think about now. Um, we are in the midst of of the COVID pandemic globally. But we also know that Ebola is is raising its head again uh, in Africa. Are we hearing much about Ebola these days? Not so much. Um, uh, and 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 so things come and go, and it's easy for public policymakers and public leaders uh, to have their attention diverted. Um, so one hopes that that by having good leadership, um, better decisions can be made, uh, whether it's for uh, one health or all aspects of public health, which I think are are, are intertwined. Um, so I think those are those are the key areas that I took away from today. Um, really want to thank all the presenters. Uh, some really some good good topics, uh, good food for thought, uh, and and good areas to think about for the future on on how one health can be better uh, better positioned. Um, so tomorrow we have our session two focusing on what can One Health do right now? And I think some of the discussions, I think we'll, we'll feed uh, you know, from what we've heard today and, and take it to the next step. Uh, so I wanna thank everyone, especially all of our presenters today um, and, and looking forward to, to tomorrow's session. And I think with that, I think, uh, well, I'm done. So I think uh, we're finished for today. So thanks so much.